can always change structures in the future. It just costs time and tax. You want to try and get it right at the start because whatever it costs right now, I guarantee you if you try and change it in 10 years time, add an extra zero and that's what it's going to cost in the future. Let's presume for a moment that we're talking to a someone who's just come out of a plumbing apprenticeship and they want to start a plumbing business. They don't really know what their goals are. They just they want to start trading. From a tax perspective, when you're starting out, it's actually more tax beneficial to be a sole trader. The risk though, and this is the downside, is we have what's called unlimited liability. David, good afternoon. Welcome to the SiteShed podcast. Great to be here, Matt. Mate, great to have you. We're going to do our very best today at making a non-sexy topic sexy. That's what my job is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're here to talk a little bit um, on the on the numbers and finance side of things, but specifically, we're going to have two conversations. The first one, we're going to talk about business structure, um, and then in the following episode, we're going to be talking about um, uh, the instant uh, asset write-off initiative um, in, in Australia. I should clarify for the, for the second one. Uh, perhaps the first episode will be relevant to anyone, but the second one certainly um, relevant to the Australians. Uh, before we jump in, though, can you just ju give us a bit of background, who you are, what you do, where you do it? Absolutely. Uh, David Rosenthal, I am the practice lead at Redinu Accounting. Uh, so what I focus on in Redinue is all about quality control, process, alignment, and training. Um, just a little bit of my own background, I've been an accountant for 20 years. So I've been there, I've done that, I've written it off, I've deducted everything. So I've been there, I've been through two recessions, so I've sort of seen everything. Okay. Yeah, well, then you're right. Your life really is about making something non-sexy look at it. <laughs> exactly. If you don't understand, I haven't done my job. Yeah, well, I'm, and truthfully, you know, I've said it before on the podcast, you know, that's kind of was my experience coming out of the trades. I had a string of horrible uh, advisors in the financial space, bookkeepers, accountants, which truthfully set me back a long, a long, a long way. And I think at the crux of it, it was just the communication. Just, I just didn't understand anything they were fucking talking about ever. I, it's unfortunate about our industry, we like to hide behind jargon, and I think it takes a, a bit of extra. I always say it's how I describe myself is passion and proactive. And right. passion is having that discipline and determination to make sure you understand what's going on and really understanding why you do what you do to help give you the right advice. Yeah, I, I think it's so important to have that dialogue and that, um, that communication dulled down and I, I say the same thing to our clients, truthfully, and the listeners out there. I'm like, you know, when you're creating content, make it past the mum test. Like, if your mum can't understand it, then, you know, redo it so she can. And, you know, because it's, it, I don't necessarily think it's an accounting thing. Like, jargon is relevant in any vertical. Yeah. And I think people, like, wait, the reality is when you're so used to and comfortable with, you know, those terms and that dialogue, you know, you sometimes just slip up. Like, you just talk the way you would talk to someone who does understand it which is Absolutely. very often not the case. Absolutely. I've been through enough meetings where if my client's sort of walking away with a bit of a fuzzy face, you know you haven't done your job. Yeah. You need to be able to clearly articulate and actually understand why they're doing it because a lot of people will just give advice but without actually understanding what you want to do. And it ends up, if they work out what you actually want to do, it actually changes the advice significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, okay, in the first episode here, which we might as well jump right into, we're talking about business structure and um, I suppose you have a lot more exposure to this than I do, but I do see a lot of businesses come through um, when they're working with us and they might be set up as a sole trader and they're, they're toying up, they're, toying with, they're talking with their accountants about, you know, if they, if, or, if they should be a business, if they should be a trust, if they should be a, like whatever it might be. So I, I think this is going to be a pretty relevant conversation based on the fact that I don't think anyone really knows what the difference is. So... Over to you. Well, let's get started. So it's a very couple of, let's just say you came in and go, Dave, I'm going out on my own. What should I do? Um, let's start off with the preface that there is no one right structure for anyone. doesn't matter what you pick. Everything has its own opportunity and consequence. So, you know, they all have their own different things. 
what you have to work out from the beginning is what do I want? Um, because what your want and what your goals are will help work out what structure is right for you. Um, I always tell my clients, where, how, what do I need to think about when I'm setting up a structure? You need to think about how you plan to walk away from it. That's really a first point. How do I actually plan to walk away from this? Is this something I'm planning to sell? Is it really just some extra pocket money for the family? Or is this just a little family business? It, it does make a difference how we structure. You can always change structures in the future. It just costs time and tax. And people and you want to try and get it right at the start because whatever it costs right now, I guarantee you if you try and change it in 10 years' time, add an extra zero, and that's what it's going to cost in the future. Yeah, right. So, you know, and in Australia, we've got four main, uh, yeah, four main structures, which I'll kind of go in detail, and then, you know, you can sort of work out which ones is best for you. So, obviously, the, the first one we have is your sole trader, which is very typical. Uh, sole trader is just me going out my own. I get an ABN, an Australian business number, and I start trading. And a lot of guys, I think, sort of start that way because they sort of go down that contractor route, whether no. subby to, you know, someone, other plumber, other builder, or whatever it might be. Exactly. <laughs> so can invoice them. And it's very easy to set up. Like anyone, like you, it takes about half an hour to set up and you have an ABN and away you go. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the advantages, it's good when you're starting off to basically, what are, and that's one of the key benefits, it's easy to set up and it's actually easy to shut down. You know, so if you're dipping your toes in the water, and ABN is probably a good place to go just to make sure, hey, if this is a side hustle, I'm going out. I don't know if this is right for me. It's easy to get in, easy to get out because you just have to set up an ABN, cancel an ABN. It's actually quite advantageous when you're starting off because of what an actually lower tax rate. Because you know, when you're starting off, let's say you have no other income, well, you get taxed on your marginal tax rate. So you get taxed like just like as you're an employee. And so you've got to remember that the first $18,000 is tax-free. Then, you know, from $18,000 to $45,000, you're only paying $0.20 cents on the dollar. And then you're only paying $0.30 cents on the dollar going forward. So from a tax perspective, when you're starting out, it's actually more tax beneficial to be a sole trader. The risk, though, and this is the downside is we have what's called unlimited liability. Mm. So let's say, Matt, you are on a site and you do something which causes you to be sued. All your assets are up for grabs. So if you've got a house and cars and everything you name, you don't have that protection. Right. So it's called unlimited liability. So that is probably the first, that's the first structure. That most mm. people start that out and they get going and that's okay. It helps them work out what is best for them as they get settled in. People ask me when's the right time to look into the next structure you might look at is a partnership. And a partnership is say, Matt, you and me, we're both contractors and we decide to go in together. Partnership, once again, is just two sole traders or two entities coming together. And we get an ABN for that partnership. And the unique benefit of that partnership Instead of sharing one tax base, you have two tax bases. So, Matt, if you made $20,000, you wouldn't pay tax on $20,000. If you made $40,000, you might pay a bit of tax. But if we together make $40,000, $20,000 gets split. So then we're not paying any tax. So you have that advantage there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. So... That helps you when you're starting off, but it has to be debated 50-50. And one of the advantages... Oh, of the part, have to be 50-50? By default, it's 50-50 unless there's a specific written agreement. Okay. And so, so, so is that like... In, sorry if I'm jumping the gun here. No. But is that... So with a registered business, for example, um, where you have like share allocations? Yep. Is it like a similar structure? Is it similar to that or not so much? It's similar. So by default, so let's just say you and I went into a partnership together. Unless there was a written agreement, the courts would recognize it as 50-50. The ATO would recognize it as 50-50. Unless we had a written agreement saying, no, it's a 70-30 it's a split. Right. So default is 50-50. Okay. 
or equal shares. So you can have more, you can have multiple partners. So if we had three partners in the partnership, it'd be a third. Got it. Yeah. And then so, and how does the exposure play out on that on that route? Oh, that's that's a that's a unique one. So you have what's called joint several liability, meaning that um, if I did something wrong and the partnership got sued, your assets are on the table as well. So you can be held just as liable for my actions. Right, being my partner. Yes. Okay. So it's a it's definitely not uh, like as I said it's a interesting one. Once again, it's easy to set up, easy to shut down. Right. The unique thing though is, let's just say you and I had a partnership and we decided to bring on a third wheel. What would happen is it actually has to set up a brand new partnership. You actually dissolve the first partnership. You've got to set a brand new one up if you wanted to bring in another person. Okay. So then you have your partnership. Let's just say you wanted to take it up to a more the next level, which would be a company. Is that kind of how like accounting firms and legal firms and stuff are structured? You know how they have like partners and they are they're actually defined as legal partnerships. They yeah. are by and the reason is is actually um, due to like historical like charters or our institute states that they're meant to be partnerships. Oh, so if you're an accounting firm, you un, it's unlikely or you're not going to be a registered business. You'd be in a partnership. Well, you have registered business. It's a partnership which sort of manages it, and then they might have separate companies to manage the okay. legals and assets and protect themselves. So the 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 st- top structure is that like all the partners have a profit sharing partnership, okay. and then they might have other structures underneath to protect themselves from you know assets and labor and legals and all that. And is that typically where you'd more common see that structure in those sort of verticals? I would see you more commonly see partnerships when two people are starting out um, and you're just trying to get a feel for another. As I said, it's it's easy to unwind a partnership if you're trying to just kind of suss things out. It's a lot harder to undo, say, a company or something like that. There's a lot more work involved. Okay. And I guess there's probably a fair few red flags as a result of things that you've seen with yeah. partnerships falling apart. <laughs> and look, partnerships falling apart is like business. It doesn't matter if you're in a company or a partnership. The same rules apply. I sure. think you have to sit down with someone and go, "How do I walk away from this? How, what happens if we have a dispute? Um, and how are we going to run this business together?" Mm-hmm. So when it comes to that, I, it's I say it's planning for the three Ds: death, divorce, disaster. Yeah. You got, and it's not just your own three Ds, it's your business partner's three Ds as well. Because what happens if they pass away or what happens if they get divorced? Yeah. Your business becomes part of the asset base. Yeah, right. So you've got to plan that accordingly. You actually got to sit down and, you know, you do it at the start because, you know, very red flag. If you can't, you know, have an honest conversation and talk about it when you're starting out and it's exciting. What do you think is going to happen when things get stressful and emotions are running because you know you wanted to take the business one direction and they're wanting to take the business in a different direction? Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So whenever I get people coming in and they're like, "Oh, we've got a business idea, we want to do it," I always tell them to you know get a legal contract and we'll talk about like obviously it kind of goes into the company structure. I call it it's called a shareholders agreement. Mm-hmm. And it's just really a set of rules that you are going to run, are going to play by with your business partner. And they have rules about you know, what happens in a dispute, what happens in mediation, what happens if one wants to sell the business. They're just a contractor saying, okay, this is how we're going to run it. Because I, I, nine times out of ten, when things have gone wrong, they haven't had that sort of agreement and discussion, yeah. and no one wins. The only person who wins is the lawyer. And I, yeah, exactly. And I think for the better part, it's it's largely an ignorance thing. The amount of people are like, we're going to set up businesses together because we're mates. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's I'm even worse. Yeah. I would rather, when mates go into business, the hairs on my neck will always stand up because I'm like, like at least if two strangers go into business, they come in from a bit more of an objectional point of view. Right. Um, two friends come into it, it kind of, they don't, they got to, be a lot more objectional as opposed to, oh, yeah, I work with my best friend. This is the great best thing. It's like what happens when the friendship goes sour. Right, which can happen in business. 
And I've seen it happen many times, especially with friends and family. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so coming on to the next part is, yeah, a company, a proprietary limited company, which is its own legal entity. What does proprietary limited actually mean? Um, it's sort of the assets, uh, the shareholding is limited to its shareholders. So you have unlimited, which is like a publicly listed company, like limited means it's open and proprietary means the ownership is limited to whoever owns it. It's not like traded on the stock market. Ah, so a public company is um, unlimited. Yeah. So when a company floats, they, they're changing their structure from, from private to unlimited. Correct. Huh. Okay. So, so that, that's not, but that's different to a sole trader. Different to sole trader. So a sole trader is just me, myself, and I. Just yeah. me, the person. Okay. PTY LTD company is, so a company is its own legal entity. Mm -hmm. It's its own legal person, so to speak. Sure. And it's operated and it has shareholders. So someone who owns the entity, but the entity is responsible for its own debts. Okay. So... And the, the difference between a PTY limited company is if I put a hundred dollars into a sole trader business and I go and the business does bad, my assets could be on the line because I'm the person. If I put a hundred dollars into a company, I'm only my only exposure is the hundred dollars I originally tipped in. Right. Because it's responsible for its own debts. Got it. Now, there are exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. So the exceptions are if you don't pay, and the exceptions are for directors. So directors are the people who run a company. They're responsible for the operation of the company. A director can be held liable for the tax debts of a company if the company doesn't pay them. Got it. Tax debts. So it's, it's not completely, but from commercial perspective, the director is not responsible. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So when you have a company, and the question everyone goes to me, when is the right time to go to a company from a tax perspective? Right. So, well, I mean, what, then, are the, what are the serendipities of being a company? Of why so you... first off, you have a flat tax rate. So the flat tax rate is 25%. Right. So you're always going to pay 25% tax, and you have what's called, you know, some like uh, you don't have legal liability over the company's debts. So if the company goes bankrupt, if the company goes bust, you know, you're not held accountable unless you've made a personal guarantee or it's tax debt. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and it also protects you. So the, you have, you're able to what we call um, quarantine or isolate profits. So let's say, for instance, as a sole trader, if I make 200 grand, I've got to get taxed on 200 grand. But if the company makes 200 grand, and let's say I only need $100,000 to live, I can take that 100 grand and leave 100 grand in the company and get taxed at a lower tax rate, and I can leave it for later. Okay. That's some of the benefits there. Okay. So, but as, 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 a, as a company, you still, pay, you still will pay tax on like your, your business activity statements and whatever, right? So <clears throat> business activity statements you'll pay, so business activity statement is in regards to GST. Right. So whether you register for GST as a sole trader or a company, same same rules apply. There's no difference there. The only difference is at the in income tax level, for income tax as a sole trader, I'm taxed at my marginal rate. A company has a flat rate of tax. Got it. The trickiness though, this is where people get really tripped up, is with a company, it's not your money, it's the company's money. Right. So if you want to take money out of the company, that has to be taxed, like a salary. Yeah. yeah. So you have to work out how you're going to get money out of the company because there's a couple of different ways, and people always get tripped up on that. Sure. It's a very common thing when you migrate over, but they don't understand that it, people treat the company money as their own money, and they don't plan it correctly. And you've got to remember, if you're taking money out of the company as a salary, you're an employee, which means – that money you take out has to have tax on top of it, mm -hmm. has superannuation, and has workers' comp. Yeah. So there's a lot of extra on costs. Interesting. Mm. And also the administration cost of a company is, is generally four to five times more than a sole trader, the administration cost. From a 
from a consultant's perspective? From just, yeah, basic, so from a basic uh, tax compliance perspective, yeah, you look at it easily like three, three to four times the cost. Sure. So, but then you're going to weigh up, I suppose, the advantages with a lower tax bracket. Correct. So you've got to weigh that up. And also you've got to weigh it up with your goals as well. So what happens is people restructure, but then they don't realize what their plans are. So the, the, and this is where it's, um, you've got to pick the right time because if, for instance, you're going for a home loan, if you restructure before that, it blows out your refinancing by two years because you need two years of financials of the new company for them, for the, for the broker to count them. And so what would a restructure look like? A restructure is quite straightforward. Like obviously to set up a company, you just need to set up a new ABN, TF. You've got to set up the company, which is done through ASIC. Oh, are, you, are you talking about restructuring from say a... Uh, sole trader to a PTY. Oh, okay. <clears throat> gotcha. So going from a sole trader to a PTY, to set up a company is actually pretty straightforward. You can normally get one done in 24 hours. Like a lawyer can oh, get yeah. one done pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. It's actually all the administrative work behind it because it's a new ABN. So you have to move everything at attached to your sole trader ABN yeah. to the company. So new bank accounts, new FPOS machines, new employee contracts, new insurance, new website. Everything has to be ported over to the new company. So generally, if you set up a company, I tell people to give yourself an eight-week lead-in time right. before you're fully operational. So you might set up a company in April, but you might not actively trade out of it till July because right. you want to make sure that on day one, your, 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 pol your FPOS machines are working, your um, insurance is up to date, your employee contract's up to date. And also, if you have service agreements, so if you're on a service contract, yep. you need a new contract because it's under the old ABN, you need it under the new ABN. Hmm. So there's so, a lot of work involved. So when you're, when people are, setting up you i mean you talk about like okay it depends on what your goals are and that kind of thing <clears throat> let's let's presume for a moment that we're talking to a someone who's just come out of a plumbing apprenticeship and they want to start a plumbing business they don't yeah. even know what their goals are they yeah. just want to start trading what are some of the things that we need to consider before we would advise down the path of one or the other i think it's one of their life goals so with uh, you know, the apprentice coming out, it's you know some of them are like, I want to get a house as soon as possible. So then we might work on what's the better what's the better structure to get the home loan. Right. So you know, but we're not generally going to get loan through the business, are we? But they might need a couple of years of trading. So it's like if they change over, it's just understanding, hey, whatever structure you pick, you need to do that for two years. So, so you get two two years of trading, regardless of the structure. Um, and so, if, what, what would the difference be then, if like, if I was, if I just come out of college, TAFE, and I've said, okay, yeah. well, I'm going to set up, and you said, okay, what's your goals? I want to buy a house. Okay, one goes sole trader, one goes business. It boils down to, and this is where I sort of gauge the people. You have to kind of get a feel for it, because some some plumbers or some apprentices, you know, they're going to be one man shows. And they're not going to be doing much. And they might, and you might go, look, just be a sole trader. It's a lot easier for administration. But if someone's a little bit more gung ho, they're like, you know, I'm going to get a couple of people underneath me. I'm going to go get commercial jobs. You, you're going to need a company. Because one thing also we didn't take up is a lot of bigger players will only engage with you if you're a company, not as a sole trader. Because if you're a sole trader, so like if you're subcontracting and you're a sole trader, too much liability. Well, it, you get counted under the the you know, head contractor's workers' comp and they might have to pay super on you and all that. If they have a company, oh. they don't have to pay those liabilities. Oh, interesting. Okay. So what you'll see is a lot of these um, contractors. So what sometimes you've got to be careful with these apprentices. They get forced into a company because their boss said, oh, you need to be a company to work for me. That's a bit of a sham contract. It's a sham. It's a sham deal because the boss is trying to get around workers' comp and trying to get around superannuation, which they would have had to pay if they were a contractor. I see. So know your know your oblig know what your rights are. And the difference primarily would be the superannuation contributions. 
Yeah. But as long, so yeah. as long as that contract is invoicing you and they're, with, when they're super as part of that invoice. <clears throat> That's fine. Exactly. If they pay, the difference is, is like if they're paying you $100 and as a, and, and they would have paid, which would have been $110 because there would be $100 right. plus the 10% super. If you're a company, make sure you're getting $110 and not still the 100 or else they're, they're skimping out on you. Yeah, got it. Hmm. Because as a company, you actually have to maintain your own workers' comp policy as well. Yes, correct. And you yeah. Pay, yeah, yeah, and you obviously that's a policy that you renew and you pay for. Correct. Mm. So that's an extra cost on you. Right. And you've so, got to pay for all your own tools and all your other bits and pieces. And people forget that being a contractor versus company, it's a whole di- there's a lot of extra costs and things involved that you end up paying out of your pocket. Oh, of course. Yeah, there's a huge amount of cost in, in running the business. And I suppose that leads me into the next question. If I'm jumping the gun here, or we're going to cover it in the following episode, let me know. But um, like as a business, there are a lot of things that you can buy through the business as business expenses. Yeah. Let's say that. Um, there's obviously a lot of things people that do it the wrong way as well, which devalue the business, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. I call I call it the barbecue talk. That's my that's my worst. The, the barbecue talk is definitely my uh, biggest competitor. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so I'm curious. Do, do those sort of did, did um, uh, business purchases? Uh, is, do they remain the same through different business structures? Like if I'm a yeah. Okay. Look, there are some different words. Um, they are quite, they are essentially the same. Like if the biggest difference is probably if you run a loss in a business, it gets treated differently between a sole trader and a company. But for like argument's sake, if I buy stuff from Bunnings, it gets the same treatment if I do it as a sole trader or as a um, as a company. It's still a deduction. It still has to be connected with your work. Um, there are different, yeah, same rules sort of apply. At what point? Does it become relevant to discuss trust? It boils down. So, um, do you not understand how a trust sort of works? Kind of, but I yeah. know most of the people out there don't. Yeah. So, a trust in simplicity is what I call a flow through entity. So, it manages assets. So, you have what's called a trustee. A trustee runs assets, whether it's investments or a business out of a trust for the benefit of a family or beneficiaries. That's how a trust works. So a trust isn't supposed to pay tax. What happens is when you have a trust, if you earn money, a hundred dollars, the trustee can decide who's going to take that money. So let's say we had a trustee of a trust and this year we gave $90 to you, Matt, and we gave $10 to me. And I pay tax, we pay tax on it in our own name. Now, next year, the trustee has a decision to maybe they'll give you $20 this year and give me $80 this year. They have complete discretion on how to distribute the money. Got it. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, where it, but the disadvantage, so let's take the example of The Apprentice. There's no tax benefit to have a trust straight away. Because the only beneficiary he has is himself. He doesn't have any family to distribute to. Mm-hmm. Because you know he might distribute it to his fa- to his parents, but they might be earning more income than he has. So there's no tax benefit to distribute to him. The other thing you got to remember is when you distribute to someone. So let's just say I created a distribution to yourself. That's a legal. That's a legal entitlement to you. So you can come right back and go, give me the money. Okay. You've got a legal entitlement to that money. So you've got to make sure that money has been paid out to you or else it actually forms part of your asset base. So if I was doing distributions every year to you, Matt, and it built up, but you never took the money, if someone sued you, that balance of money, which was meant to be paid out to you, is actually part of your asset base and someone can go after it. Right. But I mean, if it was paid out, they could go after it anyway, right? Correct. You got to pay it out. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of talking a bit theoretical here. Um, but typically, a lot of people, a trust becomes advantageous when you have adult beneficiaries on low tax bet on low tax incomes. So, case in point, adult children. So you know, kid gets out of school, they're in university, they're not earning much income. 
you know, you might be able to distribute some income to them where they have a low tax base as opposed to paying tax in my own name. Okay. So the trust manages the assets, the businesses. Yep. And then the businesses. The businesses make money. So the trust is the business. Yep. And the trustee runs that. And at the end of the year, whatever profit there is, they have to distribute it. So whatever money it makes, it has to, it has to be paid to someone or the trust pays tax at the highest marginal rate. But that doesn't mean the businesses themselves can't have profit sitting in them, right? No, you actually got to pay out the profit. Really? Every year, yeah. Okay, interesting. So you might have profit, but someone has to pay tax on it and someone it has to be distributed. Huh. So that's where it gets tripped up. And the thing is with a trust, you can't, you can sell half a company. You can't sell half a trust. You right. have to sell the business, like the business assets out. So a trust is only good if you're going to have a family operation. Okay. If you're planning to take on other people, a trust is a really good investment vehicle. So what a common structure right. is you might have a company, but the shares in that company are actually owned by a trust. Right. So then when the profits go up to the trust, you can have distribution of where the profits go. So you can purchase properties and shares and stuff through the trust. Yeah. Yeah. Different. You have different mm -hmm. flexibility. But mm -hmm. once again, when you're 23, you're just out of apprenticeship. You don't really want to pay five, six grand to set up this entire structure where you might not actually see any real tax benefit for ten to fifteen years. Right. Because until you have a, until you have other family members to distribute to and other structures, if the sole person who's taking that economic benefit is you, you're always going to pay tax on it. Okay. Cool. Because the cost of taking money is tax. Right. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, I know that's always a bit of a juggling act come end of financial year with the accountants. Like, well, what am I going to pay? My, what are we going to pay ourselves? <laughs> exactly. And it, it's a very common thing. Um, how much am I supposed to pay myself? Well, the question is, is what do you want to do? So if someone says, well, look, I'm going for a home refinance in the next six months, then it's like, okay, we want your tax return as high as possible so right. we can get the finance in. Right. But if you go, hey, I'm not doing much, you know, I don't have to do any refinancing, then, then we might actually try and reduce it as much as we can. Got it. Mm, cool. Well, that was uh, insightful. I hope that cleared yeah. up for a lot of you guys out there. Yeah. Is One thing I want to take a point on, just in yeah. regards to what we were just talking about then, people get confused a lot of saving tax and saving cash. So as you said, how much do I pay myself? you got to remember that saving tax means you've got to spend money to get deductions or something like that. People conflate saving tax of saving cash, which is that it's actually incorrect because people go, oh, I'm going to buy something so I save tax. But if you don't need it in the first place, I'd rather keep the cash in my own pocket because there's no point spending $100 to save $30 in tax because I'm worse off by $70. Right. For example, financial end of financial is coming around. I'm going to buy a new car. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, if you, you all the time. If you weren't planning to get a car in the first place, don't do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very common misconception actually. And I've been yeah. guilty of that in the early, early stages of myself. Yeah. But it was coming up, let's spend some money. It's like, no. <laughs> no, you need the money to invest in the business and grow the business. Right. Then you can look at it. If you, if you can bring expenses ahead of time, bring them forward to save tax, that's a timing thing, which is great, but don't yeah. buy stuff for the, when people buy stuff for the sake of, of saving tax, I always go, hang on a second, yeah. what do you actually want to do? Because to me, buying stuff to saving tax is never a right thing for me. So before we wrap this one up, why don't we just, yeah. as a, in your experience, general insight information for anyone out there that is currently in, on this journey, say they're getting started or say they've been in maybe two avatars, one's getting started, one's in business and they're like, well, I am actually a partnership or I'm a you know, I'm sole trader. Like what are some of the questions they should be asking themselves in the space of how, what is it worth me changing the structure? I Obviously think the first one, which, re which resonates with me is the two year of tax, uh, two years of uh, trading. Yeah. So that's the first question. What do you, what's the next plan for the next couple of years? Like, are you going for home finance? Like, are there any big life events? Yeah. Um, that then precipitates, whether I should restructure or not, and what is because if the thing is I need to get the house, 
then get the house first and then restructure. Right. Um, then the next option is, is what I really want to do. So then the next question is, is as a sole trader, am I making enough to precipitate being a company? So the magic number for that is 130,000 profit. So if, if you're making profit of over 130, then it's worthwhile to actually investigate whether it's being a company because it might be more tax beneficial to be a company. Now, just explain to the listeners the difference between profit and turnover. So turnover is how much you invoice a client. Profit is how much you make after you take off all the expenses from the invoices. So invoices, less expenses equals profit. Yeah. So um, a colleague of mine used to always say, Turnovers, what you make, profit, leftovers, what you've got left is profit. <laughs> the, the saying I have is uh, sales is, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, yeah. but cash is king and queen. Right. Got it. Yeah. So those are the two questions is where, where you go, am I making that, do I have life events? Yes, no. How much am I making? Does it precipitate warranting a different structure? And then speak early. Give yourself a lead in time of a few months to work out what structure is right for you. Don't just go, oh, I heard of the barbecue. I'm going to do this next week. Get the right advice and understand what you're getting into. And at what stage should somebody in a partnership be considering? What are the questions they should be asking if they're going to move into <clears throat> business? Uh, partnership would be how much money are we making once again? So it's a, And then what is the goal of the business going forward? Like is it – something we're comfortable with and do I have my assets protected enough that it doesn't matter what happens with the business. Okay. And sort of a bit of a left-wing question here before we wrap up, but uh, in with long-term perspective and say, okay, one day I hope to be acquired or sell this business, would that be recommended to be set up as a business or does it not matter? I look, that could be recommended definitely to have a company. So, you know, if you're like, I want to, because you can buy a company. It's easy. Okay. You can't. You can't. If you have a sole trader, you have different structuring options. You have different ways to sell the business. Um, <clears throat> when you, <clears throat> uh, a trust or a sole trader, you can only sell the goodwill and the business assets. Okay. If you're a company, you can do that, but you can also just sell the shares in the company and it gives you a better tax strategy. So it gives you more options. And, and there was one, and, and I'm going to, I'm paraphrasing this because it was a colleague, friend of mine who recently set something like this up within their business where they got to a certain stage and they, I'm, I'm not sure if it uh, broke down like through a trust or something along those lines, but they essentially um, set up different businesses to manage things like, um, uh, like pay and all that kind of stuff. So you set that up from an asset protection business. It's very common when you have like, so you might have one entity who runs all the labor and then you have another entity that holds all the assets. So you might have, it's a very common once you're in the bigger industry, but you might have one business which does all the trading, but one asset, one company actually owns all the trucks. So that way, if something went wrong with the service company, the asset trucks are still there and they can't get touched. And they pay a transfer. They pay a higher fee between the pair of them. And is that kind of how you see these, you know, bigger companies, building companies and stuff like that, close down one night, start up the next day, different name? They the operations part does, yeah. They and it's more an asset protection measure. So they have the assets in one entity and the trading in another. Right. Um, it costs a bit because you have double company costs, double compliance costs because sure. you have two. But some people go. It's a matter of what is your risk appetite. Some people don't care. Some people are like very risk averse. So they want to have everything protected as possible. So whenever you're doing any restructure things, you've got two things in mind. You've got tax saving versus asset protection. You can't get both. It's normally a balance between the two of what's right. Oh, interesting. So you can't have tax saving and asset protection. More than likely, you're, you're giving up one for the other. Really? In my experience, there will always be outliers, but every piece of advice I normally follow on, there's a, it's a dance between tax saving and asset protection. Interesting. Because I can structure everything really well so no one can touch it, but you've got to pay extra tax because you're going through two different entities and multiple different costs and other bits and pieces. 
In the following episode, we're going to come in, come back and talk a little bit about the $20,000 instant asset write-off initiative. Uh, just for the listeners and viewers um, that are considering tuning into that, what are they going to be listening to? They basically understand what it means. I know everyone hears about the instant asset write-off, or I can write this off. And it's basically really understanding what it does, what it means, and getting your head around it so you can plan effectively. Right, because it's not someone giving you 20 grand. It's not someone giving you 20 grand. It's not 20,000. It's not, I don't know if you've watched Shit's Creek. It's that magical story. You know, it's a write-off. The write-off people do it, you know. It's, it's, it's really understanding the nuance of it um, and because a lot of people do it. And the problem is, is if you don't understand it, you'll find shyster people try and hock it and then you end up doing something you didn't really get the benefit to begin with. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, mate, this has been very insightful. Thank you for your time. Um, I certainly learned a few things there. Um, for you listeners and viewers out there, I hope that was relevant to you. Uh, perhaps you need to consider if your business is structured the right way. Um, and if we've missed anything in that conversation, let us know. I'm sure I can coax David into coming back on the show and answering some more of those questions. Uh, mate, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, that's a wrap. New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you are a trade-based business and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.